Online. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the session on big data and energy transitions in the Caribbean. Uh, my name is Martin Ford, and I'll be your moderator for today's session, which is brought to you in partnership with CESAR, which is a Caribbean, the Journal for Caribbean Environmental Sciences and Renewable Energy. And today we have our special guest, Dr. Legina Henry, who is a lecturer at, at UE, Ms. Suzanne Shaw, co-founder of LeapCo in Jamaica, and Mr. Yakini Walla and Brian, CEO of Prelabs. Welcome to the webinar. How are you guys doing? Great, great, thank you. Doing well. Thank, thanks for joining us. Um, I would like to you guys, uh, maybe starting with you, Legina, tell tell the audience a bit about yourself um, and and where, how you got into energy and big data. Oh yeah, sure, um, sure, Martin. So I'm a lecturer for renewable energy at UE Cape Hill. Um, I recently completed my PhD studies at the University of the West Indies in UE St. Augustine. Um, I started my PhD studies at MIT in Boston um, on ocean waves and their behavior and the nonlinearities and their behavior towards wave energy generation. Um, I also have done a lot of research on we marine renewable energy in the Caribbean region in the past four years with students at UE St. Augustine. And now we're doing a lot of work at UE Cave Hill at the Renewable Energy Development Lab. Um, my main uh, interest in big data is towards understanding how the environmental indicators of climate change um, change the implications on renewable energy. So we have a change in environment and that that has different requirements on how you generate energy, how the, the equipment stays safe out there in the environment um, and also energy projections. So uh, big data is very important in the renewable energy space, particularly in marine renewable energy. Perfect, thank you. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll get into that a bit more. Um, Miss, Miss, Miss Susan Shaw, could you please share a bit about your, your background and how you got into the energy space? Sure, I, I have a background in chemical engineering actually and uh, decided I wanted to focus on something with a bit more of a, uh, an impact and enter the renewable energy space about 15 years ago. Um, my focus is primarily on the economics of renewable energy and that could be any number of factors relating to technological prog progress, development of the market, how demand evolves, um, new and emerging technologies, and it can also relate to uh, less tangible or what is considered less quantifiable aspects in the renewable energy space, such as the environmental costs and benefits, so uh, as well as the social costs and benefits. So job creation, um, what are the implications of the renewable energy market when it comes to broader environmental issues such as climate change and air pollution and how do we value these um, aspects when we are valuing uh, renewable energy technology in comparison to traditional energy. Um, so I've been in this, this sector for 15 years. Uh, data is of course a, a huge part of any uh, economic related uh, study and understanding implications between the, the, the technical and the, the cost aspect. And big data will become increasingly important uh, to understand the dynamics of, of the economics of, of energy in general, 
uh, whether that's renewable or conventional energies as, as we go forward. Thank, thank you very much, and I, I totally agree. And Yakini, uh, over to you. Like, how did you get into the energy space and the data space? All right. Well, I have a background in electronics engineering and energy, uh, well, energy, alternative energy, energy efficiency from my time at UWE. And since then, I um, started a company centered around the device that we um, got some support from the World Bank, BBJ. TCIC and now Total Jamaica to kind of develop this product called PowerPre. What it is, is a device that people can use to monitor and control the electrical appliances from their smartphone or the computer. So it allows for, in, in, use, in the context of big data, it really allows for things like projections, financial projections, because we're constantly collecting data on energy consumption over a period of time. And we're able to track people's behavioral patterns so that we can predict for them what their behavioral habits will have on their energy bill, as well as any changes that they make. Um, if they were to change out a, a fluorescent light to an LED light, they can immediately see the, the impact because we also do conversions from the watts, which not necessarily every consumer is familiar with, to dollars based on the local utility provider's rates. So in a way that people can actually relate to what energy they're actually using in, in, in figures that actually make sense to them. And in doing so, they're able to make smarter decisions because they they now have an insight in in exactly what their costs are looking like and to business places this data is is particularly important you're able to do things like assess when equipment needs maintenance like um identify problem areas problem departments so you can make more strategic decisions in, in energy solutions or in policy decisions that you make so that's that's where my background um, has come from ah interesting so i you know, one thing, <laughs> you know, people hear the term big data, and um, I just want to define it for those who this might be new for. Um, from my understanding that it refers to extremely large data sets that may be analyzed computationally to reveal patterns, trends, associations, uh, what, and this is related to, to human behavior and interaction. So what we see happening with a lot of IT investment going towards the management of this data and you know the, the whole purpose of this uh, webinar is for us to kind of speak a bit about how we can see it helping the energy industry now before I go forward I wanted to introduce a poll just so that we get an understanding of your familiarity with big data um so if you look at your screens um and i'm speaking to the audience now uh the question is are you familiar with the term big data yes or no 30 or somewhat Yeah, just gonna give ten more seconds. Uh, right. So if we look at the results, uh, forty-five percent of you said you are familiar with it. Twenty-five percent said no. So welcome. Uh, hopefully, this makes you interested in it. And then thirty percent said somewhat. Um, so looking at those results um you can you did you did you expect do you expect that i know before the call we were talking about kind of the understanding of big data and its importance um is this what you've seen in your experience um I, i've actually seen far less yeses and a lot more somewhat um so this this is i guess refreshing in the context of of the webinar but no, no fault to anyone else. I feel as though the word um, is used often loosely sometimes, and there isn't a whole lot of clarity as it relates to what big data actually is. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm sure just by hearing the word big data, that a lot kind of can be drawn from just the definition of, or just the word itself, the phrasing itself. It's a lot of data, and in its core, that's what it is. 
Um, but I, I feel like a lot of people have a lot of misunderstandings. There's a lot of questions about what exactly it is and how it actually benefits people. So it's more leaning along the somewhat from, from what I've come across. But um, I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of yours. Yeah, well, well, bridging from that, what you're saying there, I, I would like to open up with, you know, and I, I'll, I'll point this one at you, Legina. Could you explain the importance of big data for the Caribbean and its use in the world? I know you utilize it for your research and you have your students looking at it. Could you expound on that a bit? Okay, so I'll say before I actually speak to, to renewable energy, I would say that we have, we come, we all, excuse background noises, my windows are open in the office. Um, mm -hmm. But, We're here uh, yeah, so there's cars driving outside my window, sorry. The Caribbean islands, we're small island developing states, we produce probably smaller data sets than say uh, the comparable firms in New York or wherever. So I think I, I actually run co with um, my husband and I, we co-run a data firm called Solution by Simulation, and we did a lot of data analysis in the Caribbean region in the last five years. And a lot of the methodology we had to be creative about because the data sets were smaller in the Caribbean compared to my husband did a lot of data analysis in the United States political circuit. And so we moved to Trinidad in 2011 and started doing data analysis on political questions and also um, marketing research. Uh, and so when Yakini said big data is a term that's kind of thrown around and a, a loosely defined term, we started saying the word small data um in our firm and the work we were doing in trinidad and in some of the other caribbean islands um simply because some of the methodologies had to be refined because of the small um populations comparably however in the in the energy world when you talk about renewable energy and generating energy from the the ocean temperature or energy from ocean waves, energy from the wind and the sun. Um, that kind of data, uh, climate data, has to necessarily be uh, continuously generated. And so, yes, you get into the sphere of big data and man managing massive data sets. And for us, especially in the Caribbean, where we are on the we are basically at the helm of the the um, battle against climate change. You, we need um, expertise and ability and resources in data management to understand this is what climate change looks like in terms of wind speeds in the upcoming hurricane season, in terms of how the ocean thermal um, distribution will change and things like that as the region goes more and more towards um, renewable energy transitions. So if we have countries depending on the temperature gradient of the ocean for their energy, then we have, as the, the, um, as the, the energy community, we need to understand how that, the variability, the expected variability over the next period in thermal gradient, the changes in wind speeds, and the wind resource um, changes and cloud patterns, which will affect solar energy generation. Things like that have to be understood. So in that sense, we do need to understand um, big data in the energy community from the standpoint of operating energy devices and, and, it, and projecting this is how much energy we expect out um, from the energy mix, different islands will um, utilize different forms of renewable energy so different data sets will apply um, but yeah so i think when you think of population and usage maybe our numbers aren't as big as um, where the big data theories are generating in north america and europe and in asia but um, when you think about looking at the environment and predicting energy out of systems then we need to 
that's why I think we really have to grapple with big data and the methodology um, yeah. and the, the, the expertise in big data um, will, will be helpful and useful here. Yeah, well, I mean, um, I, I totally agree. And, you know, like when you hear the term big data, you're thinking like hundreds of thousands of data points coming through. And when I guess I would direct the conversation now at Suzanne, um, because when dealing with the energy industry and the utilities, how how can big data help or small data <laughs> help uh, the utility space? And the energy space in more, more broadly, Susan. I think you're on mute. Okay, Susan. yes, sorry yeah. about that. Perfect. Um, in terms of uh, a utility scale, I mean, some typical problems that are faced by utilities um, and in particular, when it comes to the issue of renewable energy and integrating more renewables, uh, typically utilities will, you know, say that there is a, they face a problem in terms of balancing the intermittency of, of renewable energy um, with both technical stability of the grid and in terms of supply demand management. Um, in that many forms of renewable energy, in particular solar, is producing a, a time which is not necessarily coinciding with the peak in demand. Um, and one way that big data could help is to better understand the demand uses and the patterns of those demands to be able to understand ways well, first, if it's feasible to influence that demand pattern to change, usually through um, differentiated tariffs that might incentivize customers to move their demand to certain times of the day when it coincides better with renewable energy pro production. Um, and also, it would allow them, in the context of having a smart grid operation, to be able to manage that demand hands-on themselves. So when you have the, the level of data at the consumer, at the consumption level, that really allows you a level of granularity that facilitates uh, even you know, micromanagement that could go a long way in terms of helping to, to manage some of the issues in terms of matching supply and demand and which would in turn help um, with grid stability issues, allowing um, a greater place for renewables within our overall uh, energy system. I completely agree. And actually at this point, let's, we could pull the audience again, just to get some familiarity with if they use data analytics in their line of work, and then also the size of customer base. Um, so if you would take note of your screen, the first question is, do you utilize big data analytics in your line of work? And Susan, do you think it is this still something new for the region? Uh, in terms of the use of big data for that particular application? Yeah, like, like, I mean, I I know like we've seen data in terms of even the method of collecting data has kind of been has kind of changed over time. Uh, I know in my in my line of work, I see the demand for big data analytics uh, coming together. I, I just wondered if 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 you've seen mm -hmm. seen that demand increase. I think there is a greater recognition um, for the fact that data is. It, 
data has a purpose and we can collect it all we want um but the value in it really lies in in its analysis and i i i mean i don't think the the collection mechanisms are as sophisticated yet as um we would need to see for a real you know to be able to really call it uh, a big data phenomenon across the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there is a greater recognition of, of the usefulness of, of that data and, and how it can be used to tackle problems of uh, both a technical nature, but also uh, just in terms of efficiency and costs uh, from a utility perspective, going back to what I mentioned earlier, um, the management of just that pure improvement in, in the balance supply management also has implications for management costs of your, your system. And um, I mean, as with any company or operation, ideally the bottom line is to, to achieve the most efficient output, at, the effective output at, at the least cost. So I think more and more um, as environments become more competitive, we'll see greater use of of big data to to manage some of these technical and and cost efficiency issues yeah I, and i i totally agree um the the results of the poll actually show that 64 percent of our attendees do not use big data and 36 percent do um i just want to stop here and just say um, for those of you attending you can also share your questions for us uh, in the question box on your GoToWebinar panel, um, and there'll be some time at the end to address that. Uh, but but uh, do you guys find find that surprising that number? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know what? Something that comes out of the idea of data is differentiating like different types of data or sorry different types of analysis of data and Suzanne you said something there about about how it how how we can use it a bit better um I know in my experience uh I used to work in Germany for a few months uh in energy trading and the one thing I took away from that internship I was blown away by the use of their energy marketing software and how we did the nominations for the day. In Germany, there are four regulatory zones and everyone had to receive data and analytics from the 900 plus utilities so that we could provide the traders with enough historical data so that the system, they, they had a, a data analytics system would allow them to make the best estimates for, you know, for the market trading. Uh, and I think it was at that moment that it dawned on me that it extends beyond just knowing how your individual utility or company is doing. It, it becomes now at a national scale or a regional scale in terms of the Caribbean being able to make investment decisions based on your energy, understanding your energy patterns and behavior. And, you know, we, we've seen a lot of uh, work towards creating a climate smart zone. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I just think like this is a, a step forward. W would you agree? Certainly. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point out regarding the the results is that, I mean, it's not um, something, big data is not something that, it, it requires an investment. So the fact that we, there, we're not seeing broader scale use of, of big data, I say is not surprising, um, not from the point of view that I don't think that, that, that there's a recognition that is useful. On the contrary, I'm, I'm sure there is, a, you know, widespread recognition that 
we need to be collecting and, and using this data. Um, but at the same time, it, it is an investment both in terms of systems and infrastructure to be able to collect that data, um, as well as to be able to analyze um, and interpret that data. So I think part of the, the result that we're seeing is, is also a, a financial um, slash investment uh, barrier. Um, perhaps Yakini or Orlegena can also speak to it more based on their experience, but that that would be my my you know perspective in terms of why there isn't perhaps a broader use of of big data, despite the fact that we know what the implications are and how it can be used, and as you mentioned, in terms of broader aspects like climate resilience, um, yeah. Yeah, that, thank you. And I mean, Yukinia, I would, I would lean on you here. Could you expand a bit on, you know, what you've developed and how, what that means for understanding cust not just customer behavior, but energy more broadly in, in, the, in the Caribbean space? Uh, well, it's, it's a really good point that you mentioned that big data is an investment because it, it really is, you know, it, it, it requires a lot of service space, a lot of memory to handle a lot of, um, not just the data itself, but the algorithms that we have to actually make something sensible from the data to actually analyze it and make some smart decisions. So what we'll find as well um, in doing our market research, well, we have two major customer segments, there's homeowners and there's business places and, and real estate developments as a, as a kind of a tertiary one. But when we realize what homeowners prioritize, they are less concerned about the data and more concerned about the convenience and the control. Meaning it's a lot harder to sell to a customer, to a, a homeowner who's a consumer, that we can give you data on exactly what you're going to spend in over the course of the next couple of months um, based on your behavior. We can show you exactly what your, your refrigerator is using and costing you. I think when it comes to the homeowner side of things or what, what our research has shown is that they're more concerned about the fact that their AC is going to turn off when they're not home. That if their children left the lights on, that the lights will turn themselves off if the children forget. If they have house guests, um, that they can't leave things on because they're the ones paying the utility bill. I feel like they, um, homeowners in general have more of an intuitive approach when it comes to energy. In that a lot of them have a lot of misconceptions about exactly what's using a lot of energy and what isn't. So that's the first problem, um, which is why we, we did a dollar conversion to actually give people an insight. But they also just they just have an intuitive um, inkling about a lot of things, um, and they're willing to run with that. And if you can give them the means to do what they have to do manually otherwise, in terms of remembering to turn off a heat at a certain time or if they have the convenience to turn on uh, electric heater before they wake up in the morning so they don't have to leave it on all night and have it turn off by itself when they leave home they'll buy that they'll buy into that but they won't necessarily buy into the investment needed to have um large-scale data analytics being run on the home i mean some homeowners do but for the most part they don't um so that part of our our our, our value proposition is actually Till more towards business places because that we have to charge a monthly or annual fee for the analytics that we have to do because we're trading we're collecting data all the time and that's the only way we can train our algorithms to actually be able to track behavioral patterns so that like say for example you run a business and a certain area is only supposed to have operations between 11 a.m and 2 p.m if that happens to the course of a week and it's 11 01 the next week um, our software can make suggestions to you saying, would you like us to start turning on the relevant equipment and lights and appliances at 11 a.m.? And if it's 2.05 p.m. and things are still on, we can make suggestions to say, we realize that it's 2.05 p.m. and these pieces of, and these appliances are still on. Would you like us to turn them off for you? And, and that allows, the data that we collect allows us to train our algorithms to basically make smarter decisions on exactly what we should do with with, what, with the data that we're collecting, which is a lot more valuable than the data itself to the consumer. The, the, the data itself to a lot of people is neither here nor there. But when you can actually make sense of that, when you have analytics and um, a reports that you can actually derive for the consumer on the data that you collect, 
business places especially are willing to 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 dive at that opportunity to to, to seize that opportunity because a lot of businesses don't even know where the problem areas are. They know they have a high energy bill. They may call someone to the energy audit. They may install some data loggers and ask them a few questions to figure out what the problem areas are. And they may make some suggestions, change out your fluorescent lights, the LEDs, change out your ACs to, but they don't really know exactly what impact this has on a consumer level. I mean, some, some energy firms do a really good job of, um, of, ex of pinpointing exactly the impact it has um, but on the consumer side, it's a lot, even for energy firms, it's very difficult to get the type of data that you need to be able to understand what's happening um, on, a, on an appliance level, on, on, a, on a room level, on an apartment level. Um, it, it's difficult and it's time consuming. But with our devices and the investment that business places can make, you essentially have a 24 hour energy audit telling you what your energy consumption is like and that data that you collect and the analytics that are derived from that data kind of allow business places to make smarter decisions on what they need to do next to save and where they can cut back on expenses and a whole bunch of other things. So, yeah. Um, yeah. No, I, I, I really appreciate that insight, you know, um, because what you're doing, you are basically gamifying energy consumption for, for the end user, which makes a behavioral change quite seamless. But then with the data that you get is valuable for the business more broadly, but then also valuable for a national scale analysis of how a country is, say, meeting its right. energy demand. And something that we talk about a lot in the energy space across all stakeholders is energy efficiency. But you know, renewable energy is a sexy thing, right? So we look at the production, but not necessarily the conservation right away. And the cheapest energy is the energy not used. And so I think we're we're at a point in the Caribbean where we can we can really shift the 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 approach to our energy consumption, whether it's using software tools like yours, Zucchini, whether it's better collaboration. But something that that we need to really look at too is you know big data is nice, but where's the training for data sciences? Um, what what would need to be put in place? For people to do that analysis and not um, in tandem with the automation. So I would direct the conversation now at uh, Dr. Henry. Uh, have you seen a push for development of these data sciences scientists um, who understand not just energy but understand data analytics, big data? Um, do you think that is the next step or? I mean that sounds like a leading question because I think it's the next step. But 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 give me your take on how we build the persons to analyze this data. Hi, Eugene. I think you're on mute. Hi, Regina. Hi, sorry. Yeah. Um, I okay. Good question. I just want to say before I get into the answer quickly, a big part of big data also is that in the last ten years, because computer storage became easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper, every company now is generating something that could, by some definition, be called big data. And the beauty, I think one of the beauties of big data is that there's all this data that's just there, sitting there and not, uh, and can be used to, to make operations more efficient or to increase the bottom line of businesses. So I, one aspect of, because I, Susan mentioned that people wouldn't want to put the investment towards big data, but one one of the things about big data is that is already sitting there and not, and in many cases, particularly in our region, not being used. So um, that's the one thing. The next thing I would say is yes, there is a, a there's huge efforts in the region now. I know for sure in Barbados, I see 
UE Cave Healthy Management Department just started this year their first cohort of um, data science students within the management um, faculty. I also see a lot happening at St. Augustine, UE St. Augustine in the computer science department and at Lockjack in Trinidad. Um, data science um, focuses being put focus points in different degree programs where you could specialize in data science and data analytics for business. Um, uh, particularly here at Cave Hill, we're considering doing a sort of a big data module in renewable energy if we do restart our MSc program. But already at Cave Hill, there's a big data analytics MSc program out of the CMP department, computer science mathematics and physics department. So I see students showing interest and I see um, departments investing and uh, yeah, investing in the idea of data science becoming a hub for economic growth in the next decade, um, the next 10 years in, in Barbados and in, in the wider UE system. Also, I would say that uh, from the, the standpoint of solution by simulation, which is my other hat, we do see more and more businesses calling us and expressing interest in, I have this data, I'm thinking of putting another campus somewhere else on the island. How can you help me to figure out the best place to put a campus? And things like that have been asked of my private company solution by simulation um, in recent months. And so, there's a drive and people are interested and we're seeing it in education around the different campuses in the region. Great, great. Um, I want to turn to Suzanne now. Um, just, you know, something, and I see some questions coming around here about this as well. Uh, Suzanne, I know you may have to run soon, uh, but have you seen issues with concern around data security and how how do we ensure that energy data is being not just utilized to make better decisions but also protected uh, mm -hmm. is that a concern you see working with energy with energy clients um, I would say that what I haven't seen it personally or in my yeah, in my professional um, experience that there are clients that are uh, particularly concerned um, about well data usage as long as it's anonymized um, but what I would say is that there is um, a broader issue I think which is not even necessarily at the individual client level, but um, for data which should really lie in the public domain. That, that is data which is held or generated by, by ministries. Um, so, for instance, certain data uh, like energy consumption, energy projections, um, by sector and by end use is data that anyone who um, is interested or wants to use it to analyze it, which, which has been the case throughout my career, um, should be able to access it because it's, it's data which is held um, by the government. And I think whereas that data is generally readily available in more developed countries, I, I spent um, over 10 years um, in Europe and the data availability there compared to the data availability in the Caribbean is it's night and day. I mean, we're seeing some progress, for instance, in Jamaica now where there is an energy portal where a lot of the statistics that are collected by the Ministry of Energy, for example, are made publicly available. But otherwise, I mean, for other Caribbean countries, um it's it's less centralized i would say and less accessible um in my experience in the ones that i've worked with i i wouldn't you know 
propose to speak for all Caribbean countries, but just in the, in the countries that I have done work in. And I think we need to, there needs to be a, a greater move at the policy level to make a lot of this data more widely available and accessible without having to have persons, you know, resort to the Access to Information Act to be able to write individual, <clears throat> individuality ministries to get information, which is really information which should, should be available in the public domain. And a lot of this information is, as uh, Legena said, there is information there that is is already being produced, um, but it's not being used. But I think part of that is also that some of the potential end users are having difficulty to access that information. And I certainly think that there more can be done policy-wise. I know um, there were some initiatives in Jamaica, and I think with other Caribbean countries to look at how data accessibility could be opened up more. Um, so the whole open, open data question on a client level, uh, you know, I think persons are generally a bit risk averse or perhaps concerned about what's happening to their data. But I think with a lot of, with more effort at education and information and, and how that data is being used, um, that can go a long way to, to alleviating any concerns. I think Perhaps the Akini might have um, uh, an interesting perspective at the, at the customer level, given that he interacts um, very closely with them. But I mean, that's that's my take on a on a a broader, uh, you know, data issue and and um, my experience with with customers or clients in in this domain. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually was going to turn to Yukini after you, Susanna, because I know you. I know you have to run. Um, but yeah, Yukini, um, what what are your thoughts on that? If if actually before I turn to you, I just want the audience to know I issued another poll just to find out how you interact with your customers. Do you generate data on on a daily basis during your company's organization's operations? Um, this is just for us to understand how you use data. And just to point out, this will be the start of a series of webinars and conversations um, moving forward. But uh, Yakini, over to you with regards to like privacy and privacy of that data, how you use it and make sure that it's secure and how countries or utilities can do that. Uh, what are your thoughts? All right, well, access to our servers, we outsource to third party um, people that provide encryption. Um, so we don't take on that, that, that security on our own. We have an agreement and, and they're supposed to protect us. But there is, there is still a risk. Um, they're not perfect. Even the, the biggest, most secure um, corporations have had breaches when it comes to um, people trying to get their data for whatever reason. Um, so there is no perfect. Um, no perfect solution when it comes to security. If it's valuable enough, there is someone that's going to try and figure it out, figure out how to access it. But there are a lot of things in place to prevent it. Um, and I think we are we are a lot better off than we were even five years ago on that front. Um, there are a lot more measures in place to actually prevent people from um, accessing um, data through the internet at least. So we're, we're in a much better position today, but there's still a lot that can be done. Um, and even on, like, I, th I believe it was Susan that made the point about anonymity. When, when you talk to consumers, or at least homeowners, that's their biggest concern is they just don't, they just don't want anyone who um, is going to know that that's their data because they, they have a fear that people, it's a very real fear, that people will use that data to harm them, you know, to when they're home, to, to, um, to uh, who knows. But basically that type of stuff is, is what their concerns are about business places have a much bigger threat um, when it comes to the usage of their data, not just from criminals, but from competitors um, using unethical ways of getting information on them. So they, 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 they have a much stricter policy when it comes to um, security of their data. Um, but like we mentioned, we have, we have to also trust that we don't, we don't have the means right now to be able to handle all the encryption of all the data that we have. It's, it's, just, it's a lot of data, quite frankly. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, that's that's what's that's what's happening right now as as it relates to the security sphere. Yeah. And and um even thinking about the size of the data set, right? Um mm. in small islands, you know, when we hear big data and what I've seen in my limited experience with it, you know, you see large countries, North America, um, the Europe, places in Europe, uh, talking about hundreds of thousands of, of data points. And, you know, it's like we say in small areas, everybody know everybody. It's kind of like that fair that we want to be a little insular. But, but I know there's also a level of automation not just anonymity, but automation that is constantly being embedded within the big data space. And, you know, I don't know how familiar any of you are with like quantum com computing and, and AI, but does that play, what role do you see them playing in data analysis for the region? Is it something to be feared, monitored, or? Well, we are I can just make a comment. It doesn't have to be extreme. Oh, hi. Laguna, hi. Was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the so one of the applications of AI I project is for wave energy devices and using AI to predict the best positioning of devices in an array to optimize energy out. And I see AI as a powerful tool, um, but it requires a lot of computation. Um, but I think as long as you're talking about big data and predictive analytics, then you have to be talking about artificial intelligence. Um, one of the risks I saw recently, earlier this year, I believe the the, the smart grid in Suriname was, um, if it wasn't Suriname, I, I believe it was Suriname where there was a hack and the, the country was held at, um, ransom for a few hours and hackers kind of broke into the smart grid and wanted a hundred thousand bitcoin or something like that to mm -hmm. to release the smart grid so i think when you come to a question of using things like artificial intelligence and um predictive analytics it has to come with strong and, and robust systems of security and data um, data security and integrity in the process. I believe the, with any increase in data analytics and predictive analytics to manage system energy systems or anything on a national scale, you have to up the ante in terms of security and monitoring um and encryption and just making sure that the consumer is protected at all costs um and i think that regional example earlier this year was a a clear example a clear um scenario where we see as the region moves towards smarter operations and greater use of data um we have to move towards um, securing systems well. Um, but yeah, as long as you're talking about big data and analytics, artificial intelligence and um, that kind of use of, the, it basically the data is teaching you how the trends will change and how things will evolve in time and, and how they evolve in different parameters and not just time then yeah, that, that will be utilized um, in our region going forward. Yes, um, before we continue, I just wanna say thanks to Suzanne, uh, she has to go. Uh, I, I will we'll continue for a little bit more, um, but this is one of our shorter webinars. Uh, I don't know, if Suzanne, are you, you still there? Oh, okay, so she, she's dropped off, but uh, if you want to follow up with any of the panelists, we can do so post-webinar. Uh, I just issued a poll, Legina, and, you know, 69% uh, of our attendees have a customer base that is 1,000 people or under, whereas 15% have 10,000 to 100,000 persons, and 15% have even larger than 100,000. 
So like there are different levels to to the data based on the size. Um, could could you speak to that a bit? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I guess it's it's interesting. Um, we so what we're seeing here is a lot uh, like a big potential for big data questions and big data um, problems. In fact, the before the question you asked before Martin, the answer was that half of these people collect data points every day on their customers. So if we see here that we have companies of a hundred thousand and more, and then. Um, collecting data on customers daily, then we do see this potential for big data in the energy um, sector in the region. I think Yakini's application and his his sort of solutions for greater efficiency, um, it looks promising for um, the region to use um, applications like his where you manage your efficiency and your use. Um, particularly, I mean, I'm guessing our audience is mainly energy companies, and so to see these kinds of sizes and these kinds of numbers, I think it's promising for greater efficiency in the region in terms of energy use, um, just with those two um, data points and the, the capabilities of his work. Um, one more thing I want to say about the, um, the use of artificial intelligence and use of business um, intelligence and analytics. I think just based on these numbers and the responses, I am seeing potential for the use of big data in the region to get more out of the energy companies, to, um, to increase their bottom line and to increase our efficiency as a region for energy use. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank, I, I, I thank you very much for that that insight. Um, I asked one last poll to the audience. You know, after hearing what we've talked about, how where would big data analytics help them the most? Um, is it in upstream managing generation? Is it energy forecasting? Is it customer behavior and relationships? Is it incident reporting and monitoring? Right? Or is it something else? Um, and if and if to the audience, you know, if it's something else, if it's to the other, you know, please share with us um, via CARIC or even in the question box right here. Uh, but I'm just going to give you like 10 more seconds before closing this poll and sharing the results. And then we're going to have a little bit of time for any any questions coming in. Um, Right, so looking at, I'll give you 10 more seconds for the, the vote. And if you said other, please share it in the question box. I'd like to know how big data analytics can help you. Yeah, so Yakini and, and Legina, uh, as we can see from the results, 6% of the person said upstream managing of generation, 28% said energy forecasting, 50% said customer behavior and relationships, 11% said incident reporting and monitoring, and 6% said other. No, no one shared their other in the question box, but what, are there other ways in which big data you think can help uh, can help uh, energy companies the most. Well, so far, I mean, I've seen, um, yes, that customer behavior and customer relationships. You, people have been using data, big data sets to manage and to improve uh, customer loyalty. And uh, so we see it in all kinds of um, different parts of industry. So I could see how it works in energy, but I think um, going forward, uh, that could it, that could expand out. I think these answers are based on now managing businesses now, increasing the bottom line now, but moving forward, I think um, 
we could use big data in even greater ways to to manage um, output. Mm -hmm. And and Yakini, um, I just give you one more chance to kind of share your take on those results and and uh, and and other ways you you see the big data space evolving. Uh, what what are your thoughts? Hi, oh Yakini, I think you're on mute. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, it is, it's exactly the type of distribution I expected from these results um, based on the audience. Um, yeah, it's like I'm saying, like the, the convenience and the control that we've been providing is is a benefit mainly to the homeowners, but the business places to be able to track customer behavior. Even if you're a homeowner and say you Airbnb, we've been getting a lot of requests for those. Um, if, if you want to see exactly what the usage is like, or even just control the usage of people that aren't necessarily paying utilities. Um, to be able to control and manage how they're actually using them. Yeah, the the, the, the behavior is is important, um, without a doubt. Um, it's, it's it's one of the more important value, value propositions that we we'll have from our data. Um, but as as far as it's going, um, well, for us to be collecting data, like it has to happen on several fronts. Um, we need the hardware to actually be collecting the data that we need. Um, and we need the consumer to actually be willing to implement the solutions needed to actually collect this data. We need to make this data accessible so that utility provider can actually make something sensible out of it and helping them with their load management um, or the generation as well. Um, and then we also need to be encouraging the the, um, the 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 consumer, the commercial side of these types of devices and um, applications that allow us to collect data, not just for energy, but on 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 um, consumer behavior on a whole, because the more data that's accessible, is the more businesses and the more government can make smarter decisions about what should be the next step, where the problem areas are, and how what should the size of the solution be, and it's only when we start implementing these hard the the sensors and relevant pieces of hardware that can allow us to collect this data and make um and make provisions to actually store them and analyze them. And I think it's happening. It's happening without a doubt. As as data becomes cheaper, it's it's going to be a no-brainer. Um, mm -hmm. It is a no-brainer. Um, so, yeah, it's only going to grow. I have, I have very little doubt about that. Yeah, I I completely agree, and I'm I'm very hopeful for, you know, we we as Caribbean islands, most of us we we have independence in terms of sovereignty. But I think as a region now, with the the way technology is shaping up. The way the energy space is shaping up and the overlap and interaction, we can actually have energy independence, and this means national security. This means better investment. Uh, I, that's just my personal take, and, and call me an optimist. Um, one last question that we asked in the polls was whether, you know, you can you just mentioned having the adequate hardware and maybe software as well. Uh, the last poll that I issued before we have to wrap up is does your country or utility have energy management communication software? Um, and I'm just going to give 10 more seconds. And looking at the results, 8% uh, said yes. 58% said no, and 33% were unsure. Um, so I'm I'm not surprised by those results, um, but you know, based on this call, we definitely see a future for big data and for improvement in these sort of technologies and the overlap. Um, I don't know if you guys have any comments on those results at this point. Nah, that's like, that's what I expected, personally. All right, comment. Uh, any any thoughts on this, Legina? Before we we wrap it up. Well, yeah, I just think based on what Yikini said too, that we see potential. Yeah, and so a hopeful conclusion to the call that there's potential in the region as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Well. 
I agree. And thanks to both of you and to Suzanne, who had to run, uh, for taking part. Um, this webinar was recorded, so if you joined us late or you think that your colleagues would enjoy listening to this or have an interest in it, um, or even if you have any questions about, about big data, uh, you can access that at community.caralec.org. We'll be placing the recording up there in the next 48 hours. And also, um, if you're interested in CSER, right? Um, like I said, the Journal of Caribbean Environmental Sciences and Renewable Energy, they is a new initiative um, looking to push better communications, better journalism, um, or academic academic journalism around uh, sustainability. And so, if you're interested in finding out more about that, you can go to CaesarJournal.org, um, and we will be bringing another academic uh, webinar later in the year, I believe. Uh, but again, guys, thank you very much, and to the audience, thank you for your patronage. We look yeah. forward to connecting, collaborating, and innovating with you next time. Have a good thank day. Thank you. It was a pleasure. All right, it was a pleasure. Yeah, have a great day, everyone. Cheers. Bye.